Are you guys excited to be here? Yes? Clap for me. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you the 2007 speech debate team. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say their name and a little description about this student. So after I finish the description, we're going to clap like this. Ready? Ready? Okay, we won't continue if I don't hear louder clapping. Ready? Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully it'll get better as the night goes on. Our first student in our team is Rebecca Benjamin. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, let me get the description. Come out here, yes, don't be, don't be shy. She's one of our newest members of the speech team. She is a speech communications major and plans to transfer to a university. Let's give her a hand. Our next student, we have Paul Hooper. He's 20 years old, a communications major. And ladies, he likes long walks on the beach and to cuddle. I just read the cards. I just read them. Our next student, we have Megan Loveless. She's a teaching major. She plans on attending CSU Stanislaus to receive her BA and eventually her master's in elementary education. Give her a hand. <laughs> Next we have Lorna Lynott. She's a speech major who plans on transferring to UOP next fall. After graduating, she wants to join the Peace Corps. And as Gandhi says, be the change you wish to see in the world. Next we have John McCarty. John plans a transfer to San Diego State. He is leaning towards a degree in business. And to his friends, you can be my wingman anytime. Yes. Next we have Angelina Norwood. She's a speech communications major who plans on transferring sooner or later, we won't tell you how long she's been here, and plans on one day having a perfume named after her called The Essence of Sexy. <laughs> Thank you for those lewd comments. Next we have Jennifer Ramirez. She's a broadcast journalism major who plans to become a reporter in the future, she plans on transferring to Humboldt State University and jumpstarting her career. Okay, this is a longer card, so bear with me. Next, we have Heather Rayburn. She's a speech communication major with a minor in French. She plans on attending UOP or Fresno State, where she will receive her BA after completing her master's program, it really goes on for a long time, she has high aspirations of becoming a speech pathologist and working with young children with speech disorders. <laughs> Next we have Peter Said, is a custom home designer who has returned to school to study communications. His future plans are to open a student hostel in Austria. And finally, we have Lynn Sampson, who believes that being on the speech team is the most fun you could have with your clothes on. <laughs> okay, guys, this is your 2007 speech and debate team at MJC. Give them a round of applause. So our first presentation for you this evening will be a speech to entertain. A speech to entertain can be an informative speech or a persuasive speech. It doesn't matter which. But the main emphasis of a speech to entertain or an after dinner speech, it's called both on the forensic circuit. 
the main emphasis of this speech is to make my audience laugh. And I think in the next 10 minutes, you will find yourselves laughing. The individual who will be giving this speech is Mr. Paul Hooper. Paul went to a tournament two weekends ago as a novice speaker. And in novice, it's for students who are doing an event for the very first time, have no high school experience in the field. And at times in a tournament, the novice speakers in the preliminary rounds compete against the open competitors. The open competitors are usually people from San Francisco State, UC Berkeley, UCLA if they come up from Southern California, Chico State, Fresno State, Sacramento State, San Jose State. On the two-year level, we have to compete against the universities as well. In Speech to Entertain, Mr. Hooper competed against those university people because there weren't enough novices competing as well. And Mr. Hooper came in second place in open Speech to Entertain. And so now sit back and allow Paul Hooper to tickle your funny bone. Paul Hooper. How's it going, guys? Good. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. We good? All right. First off, well, just a round of applause because I am fantastic. No, I'm just joking. Um, that's good. I'm, I was joking. Bob Barker, come on down. George Hamilton, oh, I know, toasted. And Vanna White, the woman that always knew how to push the right buttons. Now, what do these three people have in common? Well, they're very rich. But besides that, they're immortal. They never seem to age. They've always seemed to stay the same. Now you're probably wondering, Paul, well, <clears throat> Paul, what is the key to looking that good for eons? Is it exercise or liposuction and Botox? Well, today I'm gonna to talk about exercise and how exercise leads to immortality. I will cover this in three easy steps, beginning with mentally preparing yourself for exercise, then the types of exercises, and lastly, we'll talk about the benefits of exercise. Now, as you know, the new year just passed, and what do you think the most popular resolution was? Well, CBS.com states it was to lose weight and to become healthier this year. Now, as you might know, the U.S. has become the most obese and unexercised nation in the world. Bookrags.com states that 75% of U.S. citizens are considered overweight, which means over 20 pounds. 49% are considered obese, which is over 50 pounds. Now obviously we gotta do something about this, right? The key is exercise. Now exercise is defined by Webster's Dictionary as a physical exertion that leads to or maintains fitness. Now as most US citizens, as well as myself, we define it completely differently. We define it as anything that makes us get up out of our chair for longer than 15 minutes. <laughs> Now I know if I have to do anything longer than 15 minutes, I gotta mentally prepare myself. And if workouts last longer than four hours, please call your doctor to seek medical attention. Sorry, wrong subject, sorry. Now let's waddle, no, let's walk to my first step. Mentally preparing yourself for exercise. Now first off, you have to hook your mental state up with your physical body. Now Hippocrates once stated that all parts of the body have a function and if maintained and used in the way it is accustomed, becomes healthier and ages slower. But if unused, become liable to disease as well as age quicker. Now, what do we have to do to mentally prepare ourselves? We have to have a plan and some goals. Now, first off of our plan, what do we need to do? Well, set a routine time. A time where you know you're gonna exercise. For instance, my favorite show right now is American Idol. And I tell myself that every commercial break, I will run, keyword, run, to the refrigerator. <laughs> now, I also do other workouts during that time, such as abdominal crunches to pick up chips that I have dropped on the floor. <laughs> Next, we have to set rewards. Things that will keep us going. For instance, if I work out three times this week for three weeks, I will buy myself a milkshake. 
No, no milkshakes. How about some workout outfits? You know, maybe, maybe spandex because it fits my curves nicely. Whatever you gotta do, set rewards. Next, you have to find a partner, someone who can keep you accountable, someone who will wake you up at six in the morning, every morning, and take you running. Do I look like a runner to you? Sorry, that's a personal problem. I didn't mean to bring you that into sorry. Now we need to put on some music. Nothing gets my blood pumping like a little Sir mix a lot I like big butts and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. Um, nothing, nothing lights a fire in my soul like that song. Now we all have a common goal for exercising, with exercising, and that is health. We all want to be able to run without passing out, to be able to walk upstairs without gasping for air, and be able to give a speech without running out of breath. <coughs> Sorry. <sighs> Lastly, we need to have personal goals. Something that's very personal, that's right here in your heart, that will keep you going. I'm going to tell you mine tonight, but you guys can't, it can't leave the building, all right? Have you ever heard of the FMOA? Future Models of America? <laughs> Don't laugh. That is the one thing that keeps me going. That's the one thing that gets me up in the morning, knowing that I will be America's next top model. Now, let's walk, no, let's run to my second step. Types of exercises. Now, you're probably wondering, what is the best way to lose weight and become healthier? Well, take pills, of course, but some of us can't afford pills, especially a lifetime supply of them. So, the next best thing is exercise. Now, before any exercise, healthconnection.com states that you need to stretch because gentle stretching will lead to more flexible you and bending and reaching as well as giving your joints and muscles, allows them to be more functional. Now as you see here, hopefully you can see it, this is a type of upper body stretching. <laughs> now, this upper body stretching, I hope you can see that, because it is a professional. Uh, first off, make sure you get the right workout clothes, but I'm gonna cover that a little bit later. All right, so upper body stretching. Then we have lower body stretching. Now, in lower body stretching, this allows you to be able to run and stretches out your legs so you will be able to run. And again, as you see here, make sure you wear the right clothes. Now, now that we've worked out, or stretched out, let's talk about two different types of exercises. Aerobic, which means with oxygen, and anaerobic, which means without oxygen. Now, let me take you on a little journey back to your local gym. Now, if we were going to the door, and we turn left, we see a, very, a bunch of uncomfortable, sweaty-faced people running on bicycles and running on treadmills. Well, these people are exercising aerobically. Types of aerobic exercise include running, as you see here. Now, running is important, as well as walking, walking stairs, taking stairs, as well as having sex. Now, all of these use a massive amount of oxygen, only if done correctly, though. <laughs> I'll show you all later if you like. <laughs> I'll show you now, okay. Now let's go back to that gym journey that I was talking about. If we were to turn right, we'd see a room full of people whose arms seem to be bigger than the rest of their body. Well, this room is dedicated to anaerobic exercises, such as weightlifting or bench pressing, as you see here. Now, <laughs> do not let that bar fool you. All right, because that bar weighs over 37 pounds. I'm at 400 pounds, sorry, 400 pounds. Now, I've been training for years to lift that much weight, so please do not go in the gym and just lift it right off the bat. <laughs> Next, when I said aer anaerobic, let me clarify, without oxygen, I do not mean not to breathe. In fact, when lifting that massive amount of weight and not breathing, you will drop the bar on your chest and you will die. Now, the Council for Physical Fitness, in an article stated for health, it talks, it talks about how you need half cardio aerobic and half muscle building, anaerobic exercises, to increase or maintain fitness. Now, come on, wouldn't we all like to look like Bob Barker, right? right? Hey, be nice. Bob and I are friends, and you better watch out because he could have you spayed or neutered. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's run, no, let's full on sprint to my last step. Benefits of exercise. Now, what are some benefits? There's two main benefits I want you guys to see today. That is looking better and feeling better. Let's start off with looking better. When exercising, you begin to lose weight. You begin to slim down. Your appetite seems to subside. 
you're able to have run and just able to feel. Sorry, that's the next point. You be able to look better, and you be able to, you begin to have that inward and outward glow that I have. Now, <laughs> there's feeling better. Feeling better is everything. Everybody wants that. Everyone wants to have that tension-free, stress-free from your work. You want to have that nice sleep that you always wanted, right? To be able to sleep well and sleep nicely. You also get the chance to spend time with friends and family and truly relax, and it gets your endorphins pumping, which makes you a happy person. Now, I talked about how exercise leads to immortality today. I covered it in three easy steps. First, mentally preparing yourself, then the types of exercises, and the benefits of exercises in which to get the thin, muscular physique like mine that you've always wanted. Now, before I go, I have a gift for you guys. And you are welcome to come up and get it for me because I'm not going to walk out and hand it to everybody. But this is a round piece of paper, uh, obviously, because you guys probably can't see it from here. But this is called a to it. Now, I'm sure all of you guys have heard, have all said, that I will get around to it eventually. I will get, wait, I'll get around to doing exercise. I'll get around to it. I'll get around to this. I'll get around to this. Well, now I have a to it, and it is round. This is a round to it. Now the to it says, at long last, we have su sufficiently sufficient quantity for you to have one of your own. Guard it with your life. These to it's are hard to come by, especially the round ones. For, your, for years, you've been saying, I'll do that as soon as I get around to it. Now that you have a round to it of your own, many things that you meant to do just might get done. So get to it. Just remember this last thing. You have three easy steps to get, become more healthy in your life and live longer. Just remember, exercise does lead to immortality. You have your round to it. You no longer have an excuse. So get around to it. Be immortal. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, as well as public speeches, we also have interpretation events. And what an interpretation event is, is it's taking some sort of literature, putting it together in a themed program, and bringing that literature to life in front of the audience. The different events that we have in interpretation are dramatic interpretation, where we use material from plays, we have prose interpretation where we take things from literature, novels. And then we also have poetry interpretation where we take poems, poems, as Paul would say, we take poems and we put them together in a thematic organization. There are two different ways that a competitor might do a poetry interpretation. The first way would be to pick a specific theme find different poems from different poets and put that together in a 10-minute program. The second way of doing it is to find poetry from a specific poet and put that together into a program. Our competitor speaker today, Lynn Sampson, had a poet that he truly admired and really enjoyed reading her poetry. And at the beginning of the year in the fall said, I have the perfect poetry interpretation. I'd like to do the poetry of Ellen Bass. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Ellen. Ellen lives in Santa Cruz and teaches creative writing out in Santa Cruz. And she is a poet that is known around the nation. She's won numerous awards. And so this evening, Lynn will be doing his program of the poetry of Ellen Bass. However, also, Lynn thought, wouldn't it be special to actually have Ellen come and hear my program? And so this evening, we actually are honored by having Ms. Ellen Bass, the poet, here in our audience. I'm hoping you enjoy her poetry because one of the other things that she promised to do in coming to Modesto 
to hear Lynn's program today is she brought some of her uh, some of her newest books called The Mules of Love that was copyrighted in 2002, which also won the Lambda Literary Award for poetry books. And she will be signing the books, autographing them after tonight's speech performance. For $10, a student rate will be selling those books. The funds, some of those funds, will be coming back to the speech team as well. So sit back and enjoy Mr. Lynn Sampson's program of poetry interpretation. Our species can enter the human body with a laser, repair the shape of a cornea to sharpen all it sees, or crack the ribs and lift the heart from its home, plant it again. This exquisite intelligence, a brain firing 100 billion neurons. Somewhere in a barren desert, sand is blowing, burying the tents, grit biting into skin, Someone cradles the skull of a being born two million years ago. The poetry of Ellen Bass explores the extraordinary insights she finds in the very, very ordinary things. Five poems by Ellen Bass that explore the people and events in your lives that may go unnoticed and never really brought to the significance that they actually hold and contain. Think about your own lives and the things that are mundane in them that you may not even notice, but in the end have profound significance and vast importance. God and the G-Spot. The tattoo artist with the silver stud in her full red executive lips, who as she inked in the indigo blue said, I think the G-spot. It's one of those myths men tell us to make us feel inferior. Tuh. God, the G-spot falling in love, the earth round and spinning, the galaxy spreading in the glib flow of the Hubble expansion. I'm an East Coast Jew. We all have our own opinions. But it was in the cabin at La Silva Beach where I gave her the 30 tiny red glass hearts I'd taken back from my husband when I left. He'd never believed in them. She, though, scooped them up like water, let them drip through her fingers like someone who has so much she can afford to waste. That's the day she reached inside me for something I didn't think I had. And like pulling a fat shining trout from the river, she pulled the river out of me. Gate C-22. At Gate C-22 in the Portland airport, a man in a broad band leather hat kissed a woman arriving from Orange County. They kissed and kissed and kissed. Long after the other passengers clicked the handles of their carry-ons and wheeled briskly toward short-term parking, the couple stood there arms wrapped around each other like satin ribbons tying up a gift and kissing like she had just staggered off the boat at Ellis Island or like she'd been released at last from ICU, snapped out of a coma, uh, survived bone cancer, made it down from Mount Everest in just the clothes she was wearing. Neither of them was young. His beard was gray, she carried a few extra pounds you could imagine her saying she had to lose. But they kissed. Lavish kisses, like the, the ocean in the early morning, the way it gathers and swells, sucking each rock under, swallowing it again and again. We were all watching. The passengers waiting for the delayed flight from San Jose, the stewardesses, the pilot, the aproned woman icing the cinnabons, the man selling the sunglasses. We couldn't look away. We could taste the kisses crushed in our mouths. But the best part was his face. When he drew back and looked at her, his smile soft with wonder, almost as though he were a mother still open from giving birth, like your mother must have looked at you. No matter what happened after, she beat you or left you or you're lonely now, you once lay there 
the vernix not yet wiped off and someone gazing at you like you were the first sunrise seen from the earth. The whole wing of the airport hushed. Each of us trying to slip into the woman's middle-aged body, her plaid Bermuda shorts, sleeveless blouse, little gold hoop earrings, glasses. All of us tilting our heads up. Asking directions in Paris. Oué, le boulevard Saint-Michel? You pronounce the question carefully. And when the native stops, shifting her small sack of groceries, lifting her manicured hand, you feel a flicker of accomplishment. But beyond that, all clarity dissolves. For the woman in the expensive shoes, in the suit exactly the soft gray color of the clouds above the cathedral, does not say to the right, to the left, straight ahead, uh, phrases you memorized from tapes as you drove around your hometown or mumbled into a pocket berlitz of the plane, but relay something wholly unintelligible, some version of, on the corner, he is a shop of jewels in a fountain when the hotel arrives on short feet. You listen hard, nodding as though your pleasant disposition, your willingness to go wherever she tells you will make the next words pop up from this ocean of sound, somewhat like the uh, way a dog hears his name in the coveted syllable, walk. If you're brave enough or very nervous, you may even admit you don't understand. And though the evening's coming on and her family's waiting, her husband's lighting another uh, galois, the children setting the table, she repeats it again, another gesture of her lovely hand from which you glean no more than you did the first time. As you thank her profusely and set off full of doubt and groundless hope, you think this must be how it is with destiny. God explaining and explaining what you must do, even willing to hold up dinner for it. And all you can make out is a few unconnected phrases, a word or two, a wave, and what you pray is the right direction. Why people murder. I found out why people murder in the kitchen of our house back at Boulder Creek. We were making soybean patties, dozens of soybean patties, ground up in our Vitamix blender and stacked in saran wrap in the freezer. He was in the living room in navy blue sweatpants, sheepskin slippers in his pipe. He was tamping the tobacco with his thumb and looking for matches. I picked up the knife. We'd used it to chop onions, onions and, and carrots and whatever else it was we put in those hopeful dry little cakes. The details of this particular fight are lost, but believe me, they do not matter. Just imagine uh, need, uh, primitive, a baby screaming for the breast, lust, the clawing into another, waiting to, wanting to part the other like water and be taken in, desperation. <laughs> That's the big one. You're shaky as a junkie, the pain hums, an electric current, you're frozen to it, a, a dog gnawed on a cord and must be kicked off. Save me! I'm frantic, I'm on my knees prostrate, I'm flat as wax across the linoleum floor. The knife is clean. I washed it after the onions. I lurch into the living room. My breath comes out visible like in cold weather. When he sees me, he's all startled, uh, doesn't know if he should be scared. I'm emanating like a rod of uranium. He says my name tentative. I look down at the knife as if I were carrying it to a drawer and took the wrong turn. Later in the program, you'll be seeing what's called parliamentary debate. In parliamentary debates competition, what happens is debaters compete 
for six rounds. Three rounds they will be affirming a specific statement and for three rounds they will be opposing a specific statement. They never know what those statements will be until 15 minutes before they start their debates in parliamentary debate. So this evening, before we do our informative and persuasive speeches, I'd like to introduce the two teams that will be debating for you this evening. On the government side, we will have Mr. Peter Saeed and Paul Hooper. And on the opposition, we will have Jennifer Ramirez and Lorna Lynott. In looking through some magazines this morning, I came across an article in the National Review, and the title of that article, I went, this would make a good debate. And so later on, they will be debating the statement, the sun has set on the U.S. empire. <laughs> So now you have about 20 minutes to go and prepare your arguments for the sun has set on the U.S. empire. Our next event will be the informative speech. For those of you who are in speech 100 and speech 102, those informative speeches within your class are coming up soon. So, we plan on giving you an introduction into that process and a sample of what a good, strong, informative speech should look like. The young lady who will be giving the speech for informative speech is a student who joined the speech team this semester, went to her very first tournament two weekends ago, in novice informative speaking. Because she did so well, also against those university students, she actually placed third in open informative speaking. So please give a warm round of applause for Miss Rebecca Benjamin. Picture? Testing? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> what an icebreaker. All right. Thank you all for coming. Picture a strange new world. Freezing cold and dark. The pressure pressing against you is extremely powerful because you've drastically declined in elevation. The only sounds you're able to make out are the beating of your heart and the chattering of your teeth. As you attempt to examine your surroundings, all you seem to make out are shadowy figures lurking in the darkness. You can hardly even see your own two hands out in front of you because it's so dark. Then. The captain of Alvin turns the headlights on and finally you see it, the bottom of the ocean floor. Researchers from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution were the first to witness this in 1977. Thanks to the help of the first powerful submersible Alvin, weighing in at 37,400 pounds, deep sea ocean exploration was made possible. <laughs> All right. To their surprise, they stumbled over a new discovery, one that they did not expect to find. The Woods team of researchers were the first to witness a strange new habitat, an active hydrothermal vent community. The discovery of hydrothermal vents has led, has, uh, led scientists to theorize that life may have originated under similar severe conditions. 
The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recently stated their interest in hydrothermal vent research. They hypothesized that life may have originated and evolved near these similar hydrothermal vent systems. Today, I would like to focus on two main points. First, we're going to define what hydrothermal vents are, along with what characteristics make them unique. Then, we'll go ahead and discuss why scientists believe that hydrothermal vents may explain the origins of life. All right, so let's begin by defining what hydrothermal vents are. Hydrothermal vents are openings in the Earth's lithosphere, which release hot, toxin-rich fluids into the ocean. The openings in the Earth's surface, I'm sorry, the ocean floor, allow the seawater to seep down into the Earth, which is then heated by the magma from the mantle to extremely hot temperatures. These are smokers. I hope you guys can see that. Um, basically what these are, are uh, tall chimneys composed of metal sulfide minerals and chemicals, which solidify as the hot water is exposed to the freezing cold seawater surrounding them. Surrounding these smokers, some of the hottest temperatures vary from about 600 to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, some of the coldest temperatures surrounding them range from about 33.8 to 37.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Not only are these, are these temperature variations so intense, but the depths and the pressures surrounding these, site, these vent sites are extremely different and much harsher than anything that we are used to here in our environment. Now, the average depths that hydrothermals are found are usually greater than 1,000 meters. That's about 3,000 feet deep below the ocean surface. It's really difficult to be specific with these depths and pressures because keep in mind, every hydrothermal vent is found at a different location. Since a majority of these hydrothermal vents are located deep beneath the ocean surface, the average pressures are about 275 times greater than the pressure at sea level. According to author Mark Rowe, who wrote uh, the article Where There's Smoke, There's Gold, published in the Geographical from 2006, the pressure is equivalent to 50 jumbo jets pressing down on you. Okay, so you might be wondering, how do these life forms, if any, survive deep down in the cold ocean with such pressures with, in the darkness? Well, we all obviously know that the sunlight cannot penetrate deep down in the ocean floor. So photosynthesis is obviously not a process that can take place. On the other hand, we have chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is the process in which bacteria uses hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water released from these vents and converts it into foods and sugars. This chemical reaction is called oxidation, and this is what releases the energy into the ocean to support these life forms in the unique communities. All right, between 1977 and 2006, Researchers have located more than 150 hydrothermal vent locations, most of which are found within the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. However, discovery of these vents is not just limited to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. More recent discoveries have been made in the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, under Arctic Ocean ice caps, and believe it or not, even in Yellowstone Park geysers. Obviously, this map here does not show all 150 vent, so, uh, vent locations, but it does give us a great idea of where a majority of them have been found. All right, so now that we have a pretty good idea of what hydrothermal vents are, along with their unique characteristics, let's discuss why scientists believe that these hydrothermal vents may explain the origins of life. Today, Many scientists, including researchers from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, have, have um, 
excuse me, have stated their interest in these, in these vents. Okay, according to an article that I read out of Time Magazine, scientists have discovered a new type of bacteria called archaea. This archaea assists in the process of chemosynthesis and helps support these life forms. It's now believed that this archaea is very similar to the first organisms that populated the Earth billions of, of years ago. Excuse me. In the article, in the article, the same article out of Time Magazine, it stated that uh, scientists claim that the discovery of, these, of this archaea has led to implications that life may have originated not in a warm tidal pool as Darwin and others have theorized, but under conditions of sulfurous searing heat similar to those of hydrothermal vents. also stated in the same article from Time Magazine. It has been long assumed that water is a minimum requirement for life's, uh, for life's existence. Recently, in these hydrothermal vents, we've discovered creatures called tube worms. These tube worms can bury themselves underground and can also survive off the bacteria and toxins surrounding them. Basically, the point the, the article was trying to make is that if water can range from frigid to boiling and burial underground is not a problem, then it's really not that crazy to think that life may exist in the permafrost beneath the surface of Mars or in the ice-capped oceans that encircle Jupiter's moon Europa or even in the oceans on Saturn's moon Titan. So today, we've learned what hydrothermal vents are along with some of their unique characteristics. We've also discussed why this vent research has led scientists to believe that hydrothermal vents may explain the origins of life. So just imagine, the next time someone is up here asking you to picture a strange new world, freezing cold and dark, just think, we already have one, and we don't even have to leave Earth to find it. Thank you. Oh, Oops. You now you with me? Okay. All right, here we go. Our final public speech for the evening is the persuasive speech. A speech that, again, for many of you in speech 100 and 102, you'll be doing later in the semester. For those of you in 104 or 107, it begins to look at the examination of arguments and presenting arguments. In a persuasive speech, we tend to do two different things. We're either looking to persuade people and motivate them into action, or we're trying to persuade people to change their beliefs and to look at something a little bit differently. Maybe there's a better way that we could do things. This evening's speaker, Ms. Angelina Norwood, is really the heartbeat for this speech team a member who has taken numerous awards throughout both semesters and is really a superior speaker. So please give a warm welcome to Miss Angelina Norwood. Rock em, girl, rock em. Oh my god. Ooh, you guys ready for this? Yeah? Ow. All right. It's the first day of the new semester, and you walk into your classroom. What's the first thing you do? Scan for hotties, right? I mean, we might as well come to terms with it. It's human nature. Everyone should go to school to pick up on the opposite sex. It's what makes the most sense. Unfortunately, what makes the most sense in our love lives doesn't necessarily make the most sense when it comes to education. Many options have been proposed to fix the deteriorating public school system. But no other option has been as staunchly rejected as single gender education. Single gender education is a viable option for public schools. Today, I will give you two points. First, 
that the current public school system is problematic, and second, that single gender education is an option worth considering. The current public school system is problematic. A major flaw within the current public school system is that neither male nor female students are encouraged to step outside the box and take an interest in subjects contrary to their gender roles. By this I mean that after graduating high school, female students are less likely to pursue majors in math and science, whereas male students are less likely to take an interest in the arts. In fact, Dr. Leonard Sachs, a prominent family physician, psychiatrist, and published author wrote in an article in The World and I in August of 2006 that girls who graduate from coeducational high schools are six times less likely to major in math and science than girls with a background in single gender education. This lack of diversity among male and female students in terms of subject matter has a lasting impact on modern society. This means to say that the lack of integration of males into female-dominated subjects and females into male-dominated subjects creates an imbalance within our socioeconomic structure. Basically, what this means is that basically what this means is that because women aren't in going into fields such as math, science, and business, and men aren't going into fields such as social work and teaching. What we have is the perpetuation of the glass ceiling and gender stereotypes. Now, the glass ceiling and gender stereotypes bring huge disadvantages to modern society. Even today, we see that women are paid substantially less money than male counterparts, even while performing the same duties. We also see that men are often met with opposition when it comes to jobs that include teaching small children or acting as child care providers. Until we can balance the educational goals of both male and female students, we will never have a balanced social or economic system. Now that we've seen that the current public school system is problematic, let's look at why single gender education is such a viable option. Now, before I get in on to this next point, let me post a little disclaimer. Fellas, I know it's going to be a little harsh, but I swear I love you. All right? Don't shoot the messenger. So, Single gender education caters to the developmental and biological needs of each gender. Now, differences beyond genitals are real and not just perceived. According to research published by the National Academy of the Sciences in April of 2006, here we go guys, calm down. The female brain develops faster and stays more mature than the male brain from birth, through childhood, and even into adulthood. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> also according to the National Academy of the Sciences research, the brain of a six-year-old boy is comparable to the brain of a four-year-old girl. And the brain of a 17-year-old boy is comparable to the brain of an 11-year-old girl. Now wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Calm down. This does not mean that you are dumb. This does not. What all this research is just saying is that men and women learn differently. Their brains develop at different rates. Therefore, it is not fair to have these two genders with all of these differences housed in one educational system. Now, with that said, Dr. Lise Elliott, author of What's Going On in There, How the Brain and Mind Developed in the First Five Years of Life, explains that because the female brain develops faster, Women, on average, have hastier development of language proficiency skills. Now, as I said before, with language as a formidable difference between genders, is it any wonder that female students continually outperform their male peers on, on tests such as spelling, capitalization, punctuation, language usage, and reading comprehension? It's not fair. You boys are being judged against the girls, and you guys learn in a completely different way. So let's uh, move on and open our minds to this one, okay? Now. With that said, <laughs> with that said, we need to examine why single gender education is such a viable option. And according to <laughs> You guys want to give me a little something here? Can I get an applause real quick? Thank you. All right. So, Okay, so like I said, Dr. Lise Elliott explained that girls 
continually outperform their male peers on tests on spelling, capitalization, punctuation, reading comprehension, and language usage. Single gender education has been proven to substantially increase standardized test scores in all of these subjects for both men and women. Let's take, for example, Shenfield High. As principal of Shenfield High, John Fairhurst was discouraged. He had watched the students' academic performance slowly decline year by year. So, taking his cues from studies suggesting that students from single gender education environments had more zest for learning, Fairhurst put the change into effect. He united two single gender education classes under one roof. And since then, the proportion of Shenfield boys achieving higher scores on standardized tests has risen by 26%, leaving the women to improve only slightly less by 22%. Now, researchers across the world have investigated this occurrence to test whether the academic success achieved at Shenfield High could be replicated at other schools. And the results showed tremendous advantages for single gender education. 68% of boys on standardized tests for language proficiency skills subsequently passed if they were in single gender education classrooms, compared to only 33% of boys from coeducational backgrounds. Among the girls, 89% of those tested that were involved in single gender education passed that same standardized test as compared to only 48%. So basically what we can see here is that when two genders are encompassed in one house, they don't perform well because they are measured at different standards. So the next time you walk into your classroom and think about the hottie in the front row or the cutie in the back, the next time you make your mental list of who's hot and who's not, Think about how single gender education has affected your past and how it may influence your children's future. Thank you. And get you all pumped up for the debate. So what I need you to do is I need for those of you that want to, to stand up, take a little stretch break, and I want to hear the loudest cheer that MJC can bring to us right now. Let me hear you cheer. Fabulous job. Okay, are you guys ready for the debate now? Okay, before we get started, go ahead and once you've got your stretch on, go ahead and have a seat. I know those seats are hard, it's all good. Okay, let me have you all sit down. Please don't be tempted to leave because you're gonna miss the one of the greatest parts of the evening. Okay, just to tell you a little bit about what Parley Debate is. Now, most of you didn't know, but as soon as you stepped into the gym tonight, you've all been transported to the days of Parliament. And each of you is here to pay witness to the great debate between the government and the opposition. Now, the whole part of this debate is the government was given a resolution today. And their job is to uphold this resolution and prove to all of you that what they're saying is true. Now, of course, we always have to have an opposing team. So the opposition's job, their whole responsibility, is to tear apart the government's team and prove to you that their side of the debate is correct. Now they're going to be able to do this in multiple different ways. Each team is going to be given two constructive speeches and one rebuttal speech to prepare themselves for this debate. The only other element to this debate is there is a Speaker of the House who will recognize each speaker as they come up. Now this may sound like any normal debate to all of you, but something really exciting about Parley is three different elements. The first element Todd already talked to you guys about, and that was the fact that our team only has 15 minutes to prepare a solid debate for you today. So they really have to rely on their common knowledge, on their wit, to persuade you as their audience to go, against, or to go for their team. The second really exciting part about this debate is there's no cross-examination. The only way they can ask the other team a question is by standing up, putting their hand on their head, and putting their arm out and saying, point of information. Now this may look absolutely ridiculous. The reason that they do this is back in the days, the men used to wear wigs, and they would be so excited about their points, they would jump up and their wigs would fly off. And so they put their hand on their head so that their wigs wouldn't fly off. The other part is you might hear our teams in the rebuttal say something called point of order. Now they can say point of order in the last speech when maybe somebody on the other team has brought up new evidence because in the rebuttal period there's no new evidence and no new arguments allowed. Now the final part, and this is the most exciting for all of you, is that this is a very audience participation kind of debate. 
Now our speakers are gonna come up here and they're gonna say stuff that you absolutely love. So when they say stuff that you love, I wanna hear all of you pound your little leg and hit the table and say, hear, hear. So we need to practice this so I'm sure you're ready. So everybody on the count of three, we're gonna do the hear, hear, okay? One, two, three. You guys are fabulous, you're doing awesome. Now, on the other side, there may be something that people up here say that you absolutely disagree with and you think is ridiculous. So when this happens, I hear some of you already saying it, you're gonna be saying, shame, shame. So let's practice that. One, two, three. Shame, shame. All right, so well, it's time to get this mother started. So what we have today for our debate is the sun has set on the U.S. empire. Representing the government, we have the fabulous Peter Said as the Prime Minister and Paul Hooper as his member of government. Show some love for these fabulous debaters. And next, on the opposition, we have the wonderful Lorna Lynott as our leader of the opposition and Jennifer Ramirez as her member of the opposition. So let's give them a big hear here and let's get this started. will now recognize the Prime Minister. Give me a chance to speak before you give me a shame, shame. <laughs> thank you ladies and gentlemen. The first thing I want to do is thank Charlie Ewing. He's the man who institutionalized parliamentary debate here at MJC and nationwide. He's actually the one of the men who really, really helped establish this team. I also want to thank our coach, Todd Guy. He's here, here. Awesome. here, here. As a matter of course and politeness, I would like to thank the opposition team and my teammate, Paul. As you can see, it's Peter, Paul, and if we had Mary, we'd rock it. <laughs> All right, the first thing I want to do is get straight into the topic. Our topic is the sun has set on the U.S. empire. This is a very tricky resolution because the beginning part is a metaphor. The sun is set and the latter part is literal, the U.S. empire. Because of that, we're going to look at the definitions and say that the sun is set means the end of an empire. What we mean by the end of an empire, sorry, it's the end of an era. What we mean by an era is the 20th century. As of the end of the 20th century, the U.S. empire, the sun has set on. Empire is a very tricky word for us. Because of that, um, a lot of scholars have a hard time defining it, so we're going to define it as hegemonical military power. Now, I think there was some discussion about a hegemon being something to do with Pokemon, but in this case, hegemonical means dominant, ruling, top dog. Hegemonical power, we're on top, uncontested. My first contention in this matter of fact has to do with our criteria. How are you going to judge this matter of fact? We're going to say that you should judge it accord according to the amount of quality evidence. That means whoever's got the best evidence. So let's get straight to my first contention. My first contention is prior to the year 2000, the end of the 20th century, there was not any military contention against the U.S. From the time of 1980 to the time of 2000, the U.S. military was uncontended. The sun was shining on the U.S. military power. You could see this in our attack on Grenada as we went in to get college students out. You can see this in Nicaragua as we disposed of the crazy drug czar Manuel Noriega. And you can see this in Kuwait as we went in to liberate it from our crazy man Saddam Hussein. My second contention is, as of the year 2001, the U.S. military power has been contested. In this sense, the era of U.S. military power has come to a close. The sun has set on U.S. military power. You can see this in the 2001 Al-Qaeda attack against the Twin Towers and the United States. You can see this against the military attacks on the Nairobi Embassy in Kenya. And you can see this when the US backed Israel 
showed conclusively that U.S. military power could not dominate a stateless militia in the 20th century when it went against Hezbollah. The U.S. military has been hegemonical. It has been a power. But at the end of the 20th century, it's no longer the power it was. The impact of this is, is that we as the United States need to look at our foreign policy and we need to look at this resolution of fact to decide whether or not this is true so that we can begin forming policies. Our contention then is, is that an era has ended. As of the 20th century, the sun has set on U.S. military power. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> All right, of course, I'd like to start off with thanking everybody for coming today. Congratulations <coughs> on being voted as uh, new members of parliament. So here, here to all you. Here. Thank you for the speaker of the house. Of course, the government team for putting up an excellent debate round today. And of course, my lovely partner, Jennifer Ramirez. Okay, so let's get right into this. Oh, what am I thinking? Of course, I need to thank our coaches, Todd Guy, for being a fabulous head coach, and Scott Biederman, who goes so under things. Here, here. So, here. All, all too often. So, let's get right into this. We're going to go ahead and accept all of their definitions. Um, the end of an era, the being the 20th century, um, a hegemonical power, and no, not the Pokemon swim team. Um, and that this is a fact case, and the criteria, more quality evidence. Uh, we're going to show to you today that we do have more quality evidence that the sun has, in fact, not set on the American empire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But first, let's get into their first contention. Um, prior to 2000, there was no military contention between, be, uh, between 1980 and 1999. Um, maybe, but maybe it was just contentions that previous administrations refused to acknowledge. Uh, so so that, that may or may not be true, but that's a mute point. That's not really saying, that's neither here nor there. Um, the second contention is that uh, in 2001, we were attacked. But with that, I think we show our military dominance. We are attacked, and the next day, we are shipping out boys to, our, uh, to Afghanistan. The next day. Okay, so with that, um, but that'll take your first point of information. Uh, were we ever attacked before 2000, like the 9-11 thing? Pearl Harbor. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get into our examples that are not only outnumbered, but are of much value. Um, so our first contention is the nuclear power North Korea. They start, they start off with their new nuclear program, and the first thing we do is put sanctions on them, not the UN, the United States. We power up with China, who is a communist country, who is neighbors with, with, uh, with North Korea, and you would think, logically, that they would want to team up with them, but instead, us being such a powerful military, military country, they... they they team up with us and put sanctions on a neighboring country. Right there, we show military power has not, has not set at all on the United States. Uh, our, second con our second contention is that, uh, is that countries in need go to us for help. Countries like Darfur and Uganda and other countries that they mentioned go to us for military help. They don't go to the UN, they go to us because our money our military is so strong that they know that we can help. Yeah. Which brings me to my third point. The UN said no to Iraq. The UN, the most powerful world police, said no to Iraq. And we went anyway. Showing that we have an incredible... Whether or not you believe that the, the Iraqi war is fair or not, we're there, showing our strong military presence, not only to the world, but to the UN. So, 
so if we can go back to their, uh, to their on case, their criteria was more quality evidence. And I think we showed that we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt that we have more evidence that the sun has not, in fact, set on the American military empire, that we are, in fact, still a superpower, will be a superpower, and I could even say that the, that the sun is still rising on the American empire. And that their contentions are, are not of substance in the way ours are. And with that, I urge a strong opposition vote. Thank you. How's it going? All right. Uh, first off, uh, let me thank all of you guys out there for uh, coming. I know you wanted to and you were not forced. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, also, I want to thank our uh, wonderful coach, Todd Guy, and uh, all our assistant coaches also for uh, helping us out and giving us this wonderful night. Let's give them a hand. All right, so let's get right back into this debate. Uh, first, I'm going to go um, on, on their case and then back on ours to show you uh, a little bit what's, what's wrong with this debate. Um, first off, they talked about, uh, they debated our contentions and how, uh, first off, contention one, that the sun has not, has, um, did not set on, the sun did not set on our military before 2000. They said, well, maybe, and then some administrations would not actually um, like to admit to that. But in fact, like my partner showed, in three separate uh, things, in Nicaragua, Nicaragua, sorry, Grenada and uh, Kuwait, that obviously no one contended us, and people know this, and administrations have seen that this happened, and they do admit to it. So her first argument should not be upheld. Secondly, contention number two, that in 2001, we were attacked and we went straight to war with these people. Um, we're not talking about um, how we're going to war. We're saying that before 2000, no one wanted to attack us. After 2000, other countries like, and other militias like Al Qaeda saw that they had an opening, saw that we were becoming weak with our administration, and saw that our military is strong. But again, our sleeping giant, as she's talked about with Pearl Harbor, is asleep and they wanted to wake it up because they thought that they could beat us. Now, they, we did go to war with these people and we did attack them, but in fact, that's not what the debate is today. We're talking about um, how people are wanting to contend the United States because they feel that we are a weak nation, even though our military is so strong. Now, let's go on to their case about how they talked about their first contention, which is nuclear power with China and how we're helping out with them with a communist country. In fact, saying that, that that has anything to do with what we're talking about today doesn't make any sense. Um, no offense, I'm sorry. Um, but the nuclear power thing, we're talking about going out and helping other countries. We're not talking about other countries coming and attacking us. So their quality argument in that situation should not be seen um, as over ours, which is, I'll go on to later. Next, they go on and saying that the US um, that us, because of our military, that we set up sanctions and different things. But in fact, when she brought up the argument of sanctions, sanction is a political movement, is a political situation. It is not a military situation. So in fact, sanctions is not important in this debate. Next, the UN. Um, she talked about how the UN is the, U the worldwide police and how it gets out there and told us no, that we can't go to war. For one, the UN does not have power of the United States to tell us what to do. We are a strong nation. And saying that the UN, like our mother, told us no, you cannot do this and slapped her hand. We do not listen to the UN because we are the US. Now, Let's go back on to our case and talk about how my partner provided an excellent case. Thank you to my partner as well as the opposition. Um, he talked about two qualitative, qualitative pieces of evidence. Now, these two pieces of evidence, again, were our contention that no one contended us before 2000. And he provided three wonderful examples and evidence of that. Then he went on to our second contention, which was after 2000, Everyone wanted to contest us. 
Everyone wanted to take us on because they thought that we were weak and we, could, we wouldn't jump up and attack them. But in fact, again, my partner provided the 2000 Al-Qaeda attack, the attacks on Nicaragua Embassy, and the U.S. backed Israelis and the constructive and U.S. power. Now, we provided qualitative evidence, and I hope you guys vote for the government. Thank you very much. Don't leave. Where's everybody going? Come back. <coughs> We're not done. Okay. Shame, shame. Shame, shame. Yeah, shame, shame. shame. Come back. Okay, well, I would like to thank all of you for coming here. Thank you, members of parliament. Um, thank you to the government team for putting up a case for us today. Thank you to my lovely partner, Lorna, for being here. And thank you to our coaches for training us and making us a really strong team. Okay, I would like to go on to the debate. I would like to review the member of government's case. His first point against our case was that we said that the sun has not set on the military because they, are, we, they have put sanctions on the military and we didn't have any sanctions before 2001. Well, maybe the sun might be setting, but it has not set. Therefore, their argument should be dropped because even though they think it might be setting, it has not yet set. Our military is still strong. Um, their second point was that in 2001, um, my partner stated that in 2001 after we were attacked, we went straight to war because, and the, the government stated that it was because they thought we were weak. But we went in and we showed them we are not weak. We showed them, we went in and we put military in there and we showed them that we are not weak. Therefore, the sun has not set on the U.S. empire. Um, they said that our off case, that our example of China doesn't make sense, but indeed it does make sense because it shows that we have a strong military because we are able to team up with another communist, a communist country wants to team up with us to put sanctions on their neighbor. Therefore, showing that we are a strong military force and we are to be feared. Um, yes? Um. Is a sanction a political or military stance? Okay, that was my next point. <clears throat> the resolution, as they stated, was that we have put military, we have put sanctions. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that we have put sanctions on the military. And we are talking about putting sanctions on other countries, so. Okay, so that, my point is that they would define the resolution as the U.S. military is losing power because it has been sanctioned. But so how does our point of us putting sanctions on other countries not make sense? Um, and of course, the government team came up and said that we don't, ha we don't listen to the U.N. And that's a point for us. We are powerful, so we don't have to listen to the U.N. They told us not to go into Iraq, and we did it anyway. We're there anyway. So therefore, all our points do stand. We have quality examples on why the sun has not set on the U.S. empire. They might have given examples on how the sun is setting on the U.S. empire, but it has not yet set. We are still strong, and we have not lost, the military has not lost its power. Therefore, I urge a strong opposition ballot. Thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll see you again next year. <laughs> All right, to the rest of you again, thank you for coming. Thank you again to our coaches, to the government team, and my lovely partner, Jennifer. Okay, so we're going to get right into the voters. Our first voter today is that we have upheld the criteria with more quality evidence. You remember in the Prime Minister's first speech, the criteria, the criteria was quality evidence. We have that. We have upheld that with nu North Korean nuclear sanctions, which is a military, which is a military strategy. Um, power plays with China. 
countries looking to us for military and economic help, and finally, the uh, the, finally, the UN, the, us being defiant in the UN and going into Iraq, all of these showing that we have not, that the sun has not set on the US empire and that it is in fact strong and possibly more powerful than ever. Uh, our, second, uh, our second voter is that prior to, that their first, is that their examples can basically be summed up into one that prior to 2000 there was no military contention and then as soon as 2000 hit there was all sorts of military contention. Uh, this just does not stand because there was, there was military contention before 2000. Administrations, all we were saying is that the administrations maybe turned a blind eye to it and just didn't want to deal with it. Let the next, let the next administration uh, deal with it. And that after 2000, that all of a sudden there was all this turmoil and all this war, and this is just not right. Um, and then our third contention, our third voter, is that the uh, member of government uh, came up and was talking about how before 2000 uh, or after 2000, other countries awakened the sleeping giants again, and. This is a point for us. This is a voter for us. They awoke in the sleeping giant and look at what we've done. We've gone in and shown our military presence. So with that, I want you to think before you cast your ballots today, before you go and vote, are you an American and has the sun set on you? Oh my God. Shame. And with that, Shame. we are just strong. Shame. I think her mic is out, but she said that uh, it's time for final rebuttals. Here, here. <laughs> Countries come to the U.S. for military help. Which ones did she name? Yeah. The administration didn't pay attention to possible contentions against U.S. military power. Well, obviously they weren't important enough, or they weren't contentions. Here, here. Our stance is that an era of U.S. military dominance was over as of the 20th century. This is a matter of fact. Was it over or was it not over? Our contention is, is as of 2001, we saw direct military contention against the U.S. Now, does that mean that the U.S. has a weak military? No. My brother, a Lance Corporal in the U.S. Marines, still maintains that the U.S. Marines are the best Marine Corps on the face of the United States. Point of Hoorah! order. Hoorah! Point of order. Yes. This is a completely new example. It has not been brought up at all in this in this debate. Shame, shame, shame. All I gotta say is hoorah. <laughs> if this is true. If this is true that U.S. military power is being contended against in the U.S., against the U.S., that means that the stability of the world is under attack. That means if this is true, that we, the U.S., have to become stronger. But the question is, is has the sun set as of the end of the 20th century on United States military power? Our contention is that it has. We see that in Grenada. We see that we were unopposed in Nicaragua, unopposed in Kuwait. But as of 2001, we were opposed. We've been opposed by Hezbollah, by Al-Qaeda, places that have no states. They are not countries we, cannot, we can fight against. They are people Point of that order. we have to go after. Again, all new contentions. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Our voters are that we have provided you with six quality examples. Our voters have shown that sanctions are not a military action, they are a political action. We have brought to you the fact that the U.S. has been contended against since 2001. Thank you very much. Now, in the British Parliament, usually what would then happen is that there would be two doors. One door would be for those people who agreed with the government. The other door would be a door for those people who agreed with the opposition. And as 
the members of parliament left, they would leave through the door showing which side they agreed with. Here at this evening for this speech night, all we really want to say is thank you very much for coming. Leave through any door you want to. Yeah. Have a great evening and drive safely.